Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today it is time to go over what are known as the Swedish Tank Trials, a, a list or set of resources that people have been using at least over the last year, maybe even more, in the War Thunder community to try and put forward some armor values and other values for specific vehicles uh, because of a few slides, uh, it seems. Now, uh, this has been perpetuated, or the idea behind these trials and their legitimacy, has been perpetuated by moderators of the official forums. It has also been perpetuated by members of the community and also trusted members of the community. And uh, what I want to do in this video is talk about the concerns that I personally have with using these. And also I'll go through my you know, methodology of the issues I personally have. So first of all, let's go through some background. In my line of work, uh, I have in the past, and I'm sure will in the future, dealt with classified material. There will be a lot of you out there who have done similar things, especially if you've worked on the government side of issues. The classified material, which is shown in this, uh, in what I'm going to be showing you today, is nothing like what I've ever uh, seen before, and is not even standard to the Swedish system of how to classify information going back to the 1990s. So overall, it just seems very odd that we have a system here uh, which is not replicated anywhere else uh, in any decent regard. The second point, of course, is who is Rickard O. Lindstrom? Uh, the main source that people use for the Swedish tank trials tests is the PDF or the uh, presentation that I'm going to be showing you today. The majority of it has literally nothing to do with the Swedish tank trials, and there is only a few slides in it which people have clipped out to use as information for specific things. So, the first two issues I already have is the fact that, one, this is one singular source for any claim for the vehicles that are talked about in the Swedish tank trials. That is not good enough, in my opinion. That is not good enough for literally anything. You have no corroborating sources. This could have been made up by just a random person and thrown in there. And as you will see, as we go through this PDF, what you will find is it feels odd that because uh, if you can read Swedish, I've talked to a few Finnish and also Swedish people about it. This presentation is mainly about the history of Swedish vehicles, and then just randomly in the middle of it, it starts going on about the Swedish tank trials, which were done in 1993 and 1994, and also 1989 and 1990. There are no rhyme or reason here, and it to me, it seems like this PDF is three separate presentations which have just been combined together for, for I have no idea what reason. It just seems very odd to me that that's happening. Half of it's in Swedish, half of it's in English, and so already you're talking about maybe presentations which are given to different groups of people. Now, as I said, let's go into Rickard O. Lindstrom and who he is. So if you actually search his name up online, you'll find out he is involved in a lot of stuff. Uh, so he's from Stockholm, Sweden right now. He is a strategic specialist for FMV, which is a Swedish Defense Material Administration. Uh, this makes complete sense. He's worked on many different, uh, he's worked on many different projects. And what makes him a credible source uh, for stuff like this and the presentation that he has given to who knows who, a lot of people have speculated it's to a bunch of higher ups on a military side. No, that is rubbish. There is no way this presentation would be given to them because as I said, we'll go through it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so, in 1986 to 1990, he worked on the SDRV uh, 2000 Subproject Leader Protection uh, Program. So he was the subproject leader of that. Uh, the SDRV, the reason why this is important, is because in the trials of 1989 and 1990, they were testing the SDRV 2000 prototype against the M1A1 and also the uh, Leopard 2A4. So he was involved with the testing there. 
Now, if we go to 1993 to 1995, he was head of the study and technology development section of the Combat Vehicle Agency, and from 1990 to 1994, he was a head of the STRV New or STRV 122 sub project manager protection. So this guy was pretty much heading or at least part of heading this project. He was one of the top dogs at the time and all of the information that we have about the Shruidas trials are from him. Whether it's from this PDF or whether it's from his writings online in the form of the Swedish Armour 90 Years of the Swedish Combat Vehicle Development by Rickard O. Lindstrom. This is one of the only books that he's written. He's also got a ton of web pages that you can see which go through the Swedish tests in full detail. All written, once again, by Rickard O. Lindstrom. Now, in 2012, what was he doing when he was doing this presentation? In 2012, you can see BVNY BV410 sub-project manager, and then 2011 to 2012, the same thing. So at that time, he was working on the BV410 sub-project. Why is this important? Well, let's go through a quick look through this PDF before we move on. Uh, so we can maybe try and work out what's going on. Now, if you don't want to, if you want to know what the BV-10 is, the BV-10 is a tire trolley, or as known, uh, the Bandwagon 410. It was manufactured by BAE Systems, and it was used by Sweden. So, funny enough, the guy who works for the Swedish Defense Material Administration, the FMV, the guys who procure... Uh, vehicles for the Swedish Defence Force and also sell vehicles to other countries as you can see FMV is a civil authority we help defend Sweden by procuring equipment and services for the Swedish Armed Forces this means that we study what soldiers and sailors need in order to perform their tasks we then make sure that they get what they need furthermore we maintain and repair helicopters planes submarines and other material assets used by the Swedish uh, Armed Forces so these guys are behind the equipment that the Swedes have right they're not really the final authority, but they are definitely heavily involved. So when it comes to this, the BV-410, this whole presentation, if you scroll down and you go through it, the first part of it is about the history of Swedish vehicles, right? And you can go down as much as you want, and then it moves on to the STRV-2000 that we talked about in the STRF-90, which uh, stands for the Stridsforden 90. Once again, just generally talking about it and uh, being interesting. Talks about the 122, and then bang! The tests with the Leopard 2A4 and the M1A1 come up, and then it starts getting into the information that is supposed to be classified, even though everybody and their mother has it. I even heard from one source that the Swedish government would shut you down if you showed this. Well, it's publicly available on the internet. They're doing a horrible job at shutting things down if this is the case, especially since this is a public presentation. Jesus Christ. Anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, it goes through the history, once again, of Swedish vehicles and uh, finally ends up with the vehicles that they're using today, such as the SDRV-122, the uh, AFV-120A, you've got the Archer as well. It just goes through all of them. It's just basically talking from the start of history when they started using ground vehicles to now. It's a history lesson. This whole thing is a history lesson. And why is it interesting? Because at the end of it... He talks about the Bandwagen 410. And for me, what he is doing here is he is trying to show that the BV-410, the project that he's working on at the time of this presentation, is a better cost-benefit uh, analysis vehicle compared to its predecessor. So he's working with BAE, or he has been tasked by uh, his work, the FMV, to put together a presentation on the history of the Swedish vehicles, either for BAE or for FMV, so they can decide whether they want to bring across the BV-410, which has been made by BAE. That's what this whole presentation is about. It's not hard to tell. The majority of it is, uh, is either about the history of Swedish vehicles, or it's about the BV-410. The actual quote-unquote leaks in the middle of it are 
all by themselves. They're not to do with either part of what is this PDF, which is why it's confusing to me, which is why it doesn't really make a lot of sense that that is the case. But overall, you can see why he made this, right? You can understand. He's made a Swedish uh, history presentation on the history of the Swedish vehicles, and he's talked a lot about what he's been involved in, which is the SDRV uh, project in the 1990s, then the, uh, the Swedish tests, and then, of course, the BV-10 project at the end. It is so clearly obvious that this is what this is about. The question is, who is it to? Well, I can tell you what. It is not to random generals. It is either to a set of people from FMV or it's from a set of people who work at BAE so they can understand, you know, the system as well. It could be even to separate people. But if you think this is designed for the higher-ups, it isn't. And as somebody who has dealt with that information before, no, it isn't. It is as simple as that, because half of it is in Swedish, and half of it is in English. That's what makes no sense to me. Now, I've reached out for comment uh, to Ricard, uh, and some members of the team behind uh, the actual uh, the projects. I've uh, accessed their publicly available emails. After a month, I have had no responses. So what I'm instead doing is I'm going to go through this... Uh, through the presentation itself, talk about what I found using all of the publicly available information that I have to my grasp, and obviously showing that uh, why these tests cannot be used as a source for War Thunder vehicles. So let's get started. We use the presentation as a reference, and I'll skip from it to other places such as here, such as here, and all of the other stuff. So the first set of tests, right, which were done, 1989 to 1990. At the same time, there was a bunch of aircraft tests going on in the 90s in Sweden. Nobody brings them up. I don't know why. They're really cool as well. So, the Leopard 2A4 and the M1A1. These were brought to, or leased, I should say, from uh, their respective companies, General Dynamics, and, uh, ooh, I can't remember who it was. It was Kraus, what are they called? Kraus uh, Map, uh, whatever it is. Uh, Katten Vasug or whoever they are, the German guys. And <laughs> basically, they brought them along in 1989 and 1990 because they were wondering about mobility trials. It's as simple as that. They were trying to work out what they wanted for the uh, actual terrain, what type of vehicle did they want. So, they didn't test the armor on the Leopard 2A4, and they didn't test it on the M1A1. Instead, what they did is they just flew them about the place to test what they wanted on the terrain, and they found that because of the heavier vehicles, the M1A1 and the Leopard 2A4, compared to the SDR V2000, which was the prototype at the time that they were thinking of doing, it was actually better to use these tanks. Because they were heavier, they could get more grip on the snowy, muddy ground, and they could move around better. So after this preliminary test in 1989 and 1990, once again, yes, it was an M1A1, it was an export version of an M1A1, and a Leopard 2A4, I cannot confirm if it's an export version or not, but there is something interesting about uh, the Leopard 2. So the Leopard 2, you have the standard Leopard 2, whether it's a 2A4, 2A5, 2A7, whatever it is, and then you have something that is made by KMW, which is called the Global Leopard. Now, this is used as a branding name because it shows that the Leopard is used by many different countries in the world. What I want to point out is, at least on this page, the mass right here. A lot of people have pointed to the Leopard 2 that the German army uses at times, so the 2A5 or the 2A4 or the 2A7, is equal to its exported versions. This is untrue. I understand that you believe it is. It is not. You can look at the masses, you can look at the engine power, you can look at the general extensions and additions that each different export version has, but Germany still has the best Leopard 2. 
Simple as this, right? Think about the Americans. It's very easy with the Americans. General Dynamics builds the M1A2, and with the M1A2, they do have an export version. You know what it doesn't have in it? It doesn't have any DU. It has a lot less armor. Well, let's just call it the Naked Abrams, because that's basically what it is. You do not have the same battle-ready Abrams if you're using an export version compared to a mainline US version, which is why when it comes to the Challenger, when it comes to any other vehicle, Comparing its exported stats to its actual stats is just a non-circuiter. It makes completely no sense to do it, and that is what is happening here. So the Leopard 2 that was brought to the Swedish trials, I cannot confirm or deny that it was an export version, but you know what I can do? I can confirm that the M1A1 and the M1A2 used were export versions, and I'll show you why. So, let's go forward. Uh, when it comes to, as I said, the performance tests in 1989 and 1990, it was literally just working out if they're mobile or not. And uh, what came from the trials is that the heavier the vehicle, the better, uh, at least from the time. Then uh, they decided to test some other stuff. So uh, they realized that the STRV. Uh, if we look here, the SDRV 2000 wasn't good enough, and instead they wanted to uh, try some different things. They, at the time, you've got to remember, in the 1990s, after the failure of the 2000 project, the, <laughs> the Swedish was stuck with what is known as an STRV, uh, let's just find it, uh, the STRV 104. Now, if you don't know what the STRV 104 is, it's a souped-up Centurion. So they were using 50s, 60s, 70s technology in the 1990s when everyone else around them is running around with Leopard 2A4s, 2A5s, Abrams, Challenger 2s getting developed, all of this wonderful stuff. And the Leclerc in 1993 being put into service too. So all of these things prompted, prompted Sweden to either buy uh, tanks from uh, in export and do them up themselves, or work on what they wanted from a new Swedish tank. So they put down some criteria. The first one was that it had to have a 120mm gun, it had to have high level protection, composite armor, and little vulnerable uh, target surface. It had to have good observability, good mobility, and uh, also on top of this, it had to have a total weight less than 65 tons. Uh, it had to be able to resist modern pilot ammunition, all of this stuff, you know, uh, pretty much standard things. So they made a short list of vehicles that they wanted to test and they wanted to test their maneuverability, their gun and their uh, armor. And the reason why they did this is because they were trying to work out which model they wanted to buy as a, an export model and then do it up in the Swedish way, right? That was the whole point of these tests. It was to work out what country do we buy from and then how do we want to soup it up to put our own spin on it. Because if you buy an exported vehicle, it is not going to have the same protection as the mainline battle tank for that nation. Go and look at the Challenger ones which are exported, go and look at the Abrams which are exported, the closest Abrams which is uh, close enough to what the Americans have would be the Australian Abrams and that is still not there on the level of protection that the American one had. Moving on. Uh, so they made a shortlist and they basically went Leopard 2A4, Leopard 2 Improved, which is an, a 2A4 with an armor package on top of what it already has and uh, basically the Leopard 2 Improved is the prototype of the 2A5. Then you got the M1A1 Abrams, M1A2 Abrams, Challenger 1, Challenger 2, Challenger 2 with the Leopard 2 Tower, which I believe is the Vickers Mark 7. I might be wrong about that, but you know, it's, uh, it's one of the Vickers Marks at the time. Then you got the Leclerc, the Macava, the Ariete, the M84, T72, T80, and TADU. Now you may be surprised. Why are there Moscow packed or Warsaw packed uh, vehicles on there. One thing that is always looked over, and I don't know why this is always looked over, but it is. We have two factors. The first factor is Sweden is not in NATO. That may blow a few of your guys' minds, but Sweden is not in NATO. Sweden actively cooperates in peace and security operations but they are not in NATO. 
If you look at the German requirements uh, for somebody to use their vehicles, they have to be a NATO ally. Uh, sorry, if uh, they if they have an ally which produces, uh, you know, license built vehicles, they have to be in NATO. On top of this, Sweden. Uh, is is it kind of skirts the line of neutrality, right? So this is why it can have tests on T80s and have tests on M1A2s at the same time. But from the American, German, and British perspective, you've also got to understand that you never know what might happen there. There may be a few dodgy actors, and therefore, uh, and therefore, stuff such as armor values or things may get leaked, right? So you've got to be extra careful when sending uh, vehicles to. Switch Sweden to be tested, which is exactly what happened here, which is why the vehicles were tested in separate times. The TATUs, the two of them which were tested in Sweden, were tested way after the rest of them because of this issue. It wasn't because of supply or anything like that. The other factor is uh, the fact that at the time, uh, Russia was definitely not having a good time of it uh, in the 1990s. Uh, let's just say economic collapse was something that Russia was experiencing. You know, after the fall of communism, after everything falling apart, uh, they basically had a rebuilding period and they were looking to sell a lot of their vehicles. Uh, a few of them actually got sold by the UK through a third party. Uh, so, you know, the UK's actually had testing for the TADUs. They uh, were able to procure five of them by basically cheating the system with a middleman. And then uh, the Swedish were given two T-82s to try out, uh, you know, uh, to see how they handled and everything like that. Now, why is this key to the whole narrative? I'll show you why. So after the M1A1 and the Leopard 2A4 are tested, uh, and then you have this, uh, we're basically talking about the Threat Tank 7, which is equal to the TADU, which was first shown in May 1989, uh, you can see that we have this. Now this is the first slide that people use as uh, data or sources for the TADU's ballistic protection. I'd just like to thank Nick Graham, Dyslexic Child, Be Young and Blackie for supporting me on Patreon.